Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Sporting Max. But today we're joined by Paralympic swimmer Jacob Templeton. Welcome to the podcast, Jacob. Uh, it's incredible to have you on. How are you going? Thanks, buddy. Yeah, it's awesome to be here. Yeah, I'm really good. It's the weekend, so I can't complain. Living on the Sunshine Coast, and as you said, probably um, you know swimming a lot this week. So I've been for a training session this morning, and yeah, feeling good. Thanks, Jacob. Um, now, can you take me through your childhood and what growing up was like for you? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's a little bit different, I suppose, to most um, sort of, you know, other people. I grew up in Tassie, um, which it's a bit cold. Uh, the winter's a bit <laughs> cold and wet, but it's, um, yeah, it was fantastic. I, I loved it. And uh, that's where I started my swimming journey and, you know, made lots of great friends and, and stuff through school. So it was fantastic. And I played lots of other sports too. Um, play footy. Uh, for me, footy is AFL, same as you. Yeah. Um, although footy here in Queensland is NRL to all the people up here. So played some footy, played some basketball. Um, also, what else did I do? Um, I think one of the things that was the hardest, though, is obviously my disability. Um, that yep. was hard as a kid. Um, you know, it was, it was just managing and adjusting to what life is like for me. And the good mm-hmm. thing for me is sport provided an opportunity to be able to express myself and um, yep. go out there and show other kids no matter what you can you can give it a crack and still be just as good mm-hmm. so did you look up to like any sort of like sports people or f- people growing up yeah I think um I was born in 95 and yep. I, I was pretty young when the Olympics happened in 2000 but um you know seeing the champions such as Michael Phelps and Ian Thorpe mm-hmm. sort of go through their careers I think for swimming that was me um, also, you know, um, I'm a big basketball fan too. So yeah. the likes of Kobe Bryant, LeBron James, mm-hmm. I love those fellas and just seeing them, just uh, the professionalism, not only on the court, but what they do to impact the world off the court is pretty cool too. Um, now, junior swimming, I believe you swam for Devonport um, in Tassie, like you mentioned. Um, where did your love of swimming sort of first develop or begin? Yeah, I think the thing for me with swimming when I was a youngster is I picked it up pretty quick and I was pretty successful Mm -hmm. at a young age. Um, I broke a couple of state records when I was 11, age group (laughs) record. It was, yeah, it was all looking pretty smooth and strong. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think with, um, obviously it doesn't always work out this way, but I think with having a bit of success and going well, I I started to just love it. Uh, I love the feeling um, touching the wall and trying to get a personal best. Um, mm-hmm. But throughout my teenage years, I, I struggled a lot. I actually plateaued for a number of years when, you know, through wow. your teenage years, naturally yeah. you get bigger, stronger and better. So I think it started with just having that enjoyment of just swimming nice and fast at a mm-hmm. young age, and then it just carried through from then. Um, now, in 2012, you competed uh, in your first multi-class event at age 17. Um, can you expand on this? Yeah, mate. Um, so I've had the vision impairment my whole life. I was born with it. And unfortunately, mm-hmm. it does deteriorate. It gets worse as I get older. So um, that has its little complexities. But the thing for me that is great with sport is that in para sport, I can compete against other people that have similar disability. Not necessarily the exact same disability, but, um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, my, my classification has people that are all legally blind and struggle yep. with their vision. So um, a family friend of, um, of ours suggested, you know, Jay's got terrible eyesight. We all know this. Why doesn't mm-hmm. he try the para sport? You know, he's, he's given it his best shot in the able-bodied side of the sport and mm-hmm. he's doing well. But as a para-athlete, he might actually go really well. So I just, I just did it. And, yeah, like <laughs> you said, I, I never looked back and made my first Australian team almost within a year or two of getting classified as a para swimmer. Um, so how did you get, like you mentioned, to make that Australian team um, and go to the Parapan Pacific Championships in 2014 in California? How did you get them to notice you, um, for you to be picked and go over there? Yeah, that's a great question. So to become a para-athlete, you have to do a series of tests to prove your disability. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, you have to have a specific disability or struggle in different ways. So mm-hmm. for me, um, you know, they can they do all the fancy sciencey stuff to be able to look at my mm-hmm. eyes and they see that they're not like a normal eye. So they know mm-hmm. just by looking at it through their fancy equipment that my eyeballs and my retinas uh, are not sort of as normal functioning, but also yeah. I do a series of other tests. So you've got to prove you are a para-athlete first. And then from there, swimming is all about performing at the, the one big meet or the couple of big meets every single mm-hmm. year. So the trials or the Australian Championship, sometimes it's called, you have to perform at that competition and get a specific um, great result and then from mm-hmm. there they select the team the Australian team from those trials so that's what happened in that year and that's what has happened every year. Um, I see you swam well at the Australian Open Swimming Championships in 2015 
Um, now, this led to you actually being picked um, for the IPC World Championships. Um, can you take me through this experience um, of going over to these championships? For sure. Yeah, the, the IPC World Championships was the first competition that I'd ever done representing mm -hmm. Australia where all countries are there. Um, Pan Packs was a, an amazing first experience uh, uh, debuting for Australia, but um, yep. the Pan Packs doesn't have all the countries around the world. So it was cool to go to a different type of competition as well. Um, they all have their strengths and their, um, you know, their amazing features. But that was the big stepping stone for me. And making a final in the 400 metres freestyle was a huge experience. Um, I was swimming out in one of the outside lanes. But for me at that stage, just being there was amazing. Um, mm -hmm. And it was a great platform to, to then move forward. So what would be like just swimming in general? What would be your most preferred lane swimming? Would it be on one of the inside lanes or one of the outside lanes? Apparently one of the outside lanes is actually the fastest. I don't know how exactly <laughs> that works. Maybe, yeah, I don't know. Maybe no one sort of sees you out there. But mm -hmm. uh, I don't mind being in the middle. I think yep. lane four has a little bit of a pressure on sometimes because you're the mm -hmm. fastest ranked or whatever going in. But I also like three and five. I like being on just mm -hmm. on the outside of that, that favourite and you try and try and knock the favourite off. Mm -hmm. um, now, I know you attended uh, the Road to Rio Development Camp at the AIS um, in Canberra. Can you elaborate on this and this experience of like the world-class facilities um, that the AIS has? Yeah, the AIS is pretty amazing. Um, mm -hmm. It's got, you know, all the world-class recovery facilities and obviously the swimming pools are top-notch as well. You can do all, practice all your starts and your finishes mm -hmm. and turns and see exactly how, many, how much force you're producing when you hit the wall and push off the blocks and, um, mm -hmm. you know, the underwater cameras. You can see yourself uh, in fine detail how you're swimming slowed down and, just seeing this for the first time, that was my first taste of just having all this yep. world-class equipment. Um, not only <laughs> just got to see my footage of uh, my swimming on a camera or on a phone, mm -hmm. uh, which you know, back then it was probably not very high quality. So <laughs> um, I think, yeah, seeing all of this and getting a taste of this is what it's like to be an elite athlete. I'm not quite there yet. I'm, it's, you know, still the development camp, but um, Australia has some great pathways. You know, a lot of the athletes who go through these pathways do then go on to make Australian teams. So it was... It was a cool experience and, you know, the dining hall at the AIS is pretty cool too. It's a big selection of whatever food you want to eat. So you've got to, you've got to uh, steer clear of the temptation sometimes. <laughs> um, now, going to those Rio Olympic Games, what excited you most heading into those games and obviously the travel over there? Yeah, I think the, the, the unknown feeling of what it's going to be like is sometimes mm -hmm. a little bit of a daunting experience. Like sometimes if you're not sure if something's going to go well or not, I think it yep. can be a bit scary. but for me, it was like, it's just going to be amazing no matter what. So mm -hmm. for me, it was, um, it's going to be crazy. I don't know exactly what it's going to be like. So I'm just excited. Uh -huh. to get So I don't usually get excited for, for many things, um, but I was just like a, you know, a, a young kid again, just trying to mm -hmm. um, sort of explore the world. And it was amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the lead up was crazy. Just getting all the different little media things that were coming mm -hmm. around. You go into the Paralympics. Um, getting a taste of all of that was cool. And it's like, this is what we do it for. This is what we do it for, to be at the top and compete at the Games. Um, now, swimming at the Paralympic Games, um, it's an incredible feature for anyone. But how do you did you prepare physically and mentally um, for those Games? Yeah, it was. It's, uh, it's just like preparing for a normal competition. But I think it's because it's the biggest one of the, them all, I think you, um, you just have this extra little bit of hype around it. Maybe yep. you know, I'm, I pride myself on training hard and I give it 100% all the time, but maybe you do somehow get that 101% when it comes to the, you know, to that Paralympic time or that, that mm -hmm. big, that every four years, well, this time it's been five years, but um, yeah, you just get that little bit of fever and hype about it. And I think that gives you that extra little bit of a push. And perhaps that's why the, the results are always so good in that, that pinnacle event. Um, now you are placing eighth in the 200 metre um, individual medley and six in the 400 metre freestyle while also competing um, in the 1500 metre freestyle and 100 metre butterfly. Um, now what's running through your mind as you're swimming um, or about to take off in these events? Yeah, great. Um, I think the 100 fly was my first one on day one. Mm -hmm. So I had a big, a big program, as you said, and it was 10 day competition which is a long, it's a long um, drawn out competition. Um, mm -hmm. I raced on every odd day. So I had one day on, one day off. <laughs> um, so the butterfly was on day one. Um, I can't mm -hmm. even remember what happened in the race. You know, even when I finished, 
I was mm-hmm. like, yep, did a PB apparently. I, I can't read the board. Um, <laughs> I thought, but I got told by my coach or my mate that, um, yeah, it was PB. Um, mm-hmm. But I was thinking, what actually happened in that race? I was so nervous. <laughs> I obviously, it was going as hard as I could. Yeah. But it, yeah, it was crazy. But I think as the week went on, um, you know, I made a couple of finals, like you said, and I just brought it back to, to basics and really just tried to enjoy the moment. If, if I did get a little carried away and just get caught up in the moment, then it's okay as long as you can kind of control it and use it to your advantage. So it was, yeah, it was a roller coaster uh, of emotions, but yeah, it was just treating it like a normal competition, really. What are your best memories um, of the Paralympic Games? Making finals for sure, walking mm-hmm. out and, and seeing the crowd or hearing the crowd and giving them a wave and jumping mm-hmm. in. Uh, every, it, the, there's so many people in the complex, but when when the, mm-hmm. the starter says "take your marks," the whole place goes dead and mm-hmm. it's quiet and it's all you know, <laughs> it's all on you and the other seven guys. So it, it's cool uh, having that major sort of feeling of being at a you know this is what it's all about, but mm-hmm. also the village as well. Having the athletes' village where it's just the athletes mm-hmm. uh, and, and the staff as well. Um, just even seeing the the dining hall, you know, the dining hall is huge. It's got yeah. any food you can possibly <laughs> imagine. Um, just seeing all the different bits and pieces that come with it. And um, a couple of the guys that I train with or have trained with, the older the mm-hmm. older fellas, I call them, they've been to a games before and they also came with me to Rio and competed. And they were saying that it's just like a big theme or amusement park for athletes. Mm-hmm. You know, there's no Superman ride or anything, but there are <laughs> crazy things that you can see around and have fun and do. But like I said, you're there to compete. You can have a bit of fun after, but it's, mm-hmm. it is hard because there's so many cool stuff cool things that you've got to try and just say, no, I'm going to bed, I'm going to hang yep. out and, rest and compete and then have fun. Mm-hmm. Um, now, as a swimmer, how do you train your body um, to be able to sustain and train um, and sort of be able to swim for long periods in the pool? I mean, do you do cardio or is that weights or just actually time in the pool swimming? Yeah, we train a lot. I think swimmers, I, think, I know every single sport is extremely challenging mm-hmm. uh, and you've got to train a lot, but I think swimming is one of those ones which is known for just swimming up and down a pool. There's yeah. a lot of training involved. So um, a, a weekly plan for me would be somewhere between eight and ten swimming workouts a week that go for two hours. Um, wow. Every time, yeah, it's a lot of swimming. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we train as well. We get there roughly 45 minutes before and do whether it be some stretching or some core work or some mm-hmm. um, resistance work, maybe some cycling, some running, and then three times a week as well in the gym for an hour, an hour and a half. So it's a, maybe wow. up to 30 hours of exercise every week, <laughs> probably more. Um, but, yeah, you, you've got to be able to do it because it's 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 not the fact that the rest of the world's doing it, so we've got mm-hmm. to do it too. I think we're trying to do it, or I'm trying to do it a bit smarter as well. Now that I'm getting a little older, I've got to find the little ways that I can tick off those one percenters because – um, I've always trained hard. I'm always going to train hard, but you've mm-hmm. got to find the extra little things that you can do better than everyone else. So where are you uh, currently swimming right now? Uh, the Sunshine Coast um, mm-hmm. at the University of the Sunshine Coast. Um, now, I believe your swim coach um, has been Nathan Doyle. What's he like and what's he like uh, been like to learn under and work with? For sure. Nate, Nate is great. He, uh, he has a full plate. We've got 10 athletes or mm-hmm. nine or 10 athletes at the moment. He's... Uh, yeah, he's balancing all of us. And I think the great thing about Nathan uh, is that he not only is really, you know, an amazing swimming coach in terms of the technique, the programs and everything, but manages us mm-hmm. really well as people. And, um, you know, some of us work, some of us go to uni and just being flexible in terms of, you know, understanding we might be a bit tired some days. We might feel, you know, we might be ready to go some days when, when he doesn't mm-hmm. want us to go hard. So <laughs> He's a great coach in the way that he is very, he's a people person and he understands us as people. Um, and he doesn't just think of us as this, um, his, this robot. He, he always says, you know, <laughs> we don't want to be like robots. He doesn't look <laughs> at us like robots and say, swim up and down a hundred times. <laughs> um, he understands that there's so many more things involved. So obviously great coach, um, but manages us and, and deals with us as people first. Um, now, I spoke to you before the podcast about sort of Tokyo and um, you mentioned that you're probably not going to that. Um, can you expand on this and um, tell the listeners what's going on? For sure. It's a crazy, it's crazy time. So two mm-hmm. years ago, I missed out on the World Champs by 0. Uh, roughly three of a second. So tiny amount. Um, but mm-hmm. that's fueled my fire for the last two years. Um, so I know I'm backtracking a little bit. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I, I did have to do a personal best at these trials to make the team. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, I... 
I knew I could do it. I've been training so hard for a couple of years now. Obviously, it was meant to be last year. Um, mm -hmm. And the qualifying times are um, third in the world for your specific event, plus 1.2. Mm -hmm. So they were really hard qualifying times. Um, and I got the qualifying time. So, you know, I, I set out to achieve exactly what I wanted to achieve. Yep. Um, Australia is only allowed to take 17 men and then 15 mm -hmm. uh, women. Um, and it's just each country gets a different number. Maybe some countries mm -hmm. might have more women than men. Um, just, uh, you know, that's just the way that it worked out. Um, and that's not many in a way because you have 14 different classifications. And within each classification, mm -hmm. you have about five or six races so mm -hmm. there's so many opportunities for people to get the time. So the unfortunate thing for me is there was more people that got the time than the quota of athletes that Australia can take. So mm -hmm. at the moment, or, or no, I'm not on the team. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't make the team, even though I, I mm -hmm. qualified for the team. Um, but I'm hoping that perhaps there might be a way that Australia could be granted some more slots. We'll find out. Um, you know, yes. um, at the moment, no, I'm not going. Uh, long story short. <laughs> Um, now, I've got to ask you this question because I'm a sort of big Saints fan um, over here in Melbourne. I believe you're cousins with our former St Kilda Saint, Eli Templeton. Um, what's yeah. Eli like from uh, from your perspective? Uh, he's a great bloke. Yeah, he's uh, playing very well with his footy as well at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, he's, he's doing fantastic. So, um, you know, playing for the Sainers, I don't mind the Sainers. I go for Carlton yeah. myself. Um, <laughs> so, you know, there's a couple other teams that I don't like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who they are, but I, yeah, I like the Saints and Eli's going really well. Um, and Jack as well. Um, Jack is Eli's brother. He plays footy mm -hmm. down in Asie as well, where we're all from. So yeah, my, my family and, and dad and my uncle as well, they're great at footy. So maybe if my eyesight was all right, I could have played footy as well. But I used to get, <laughs> I used to get crunched in the tackles because I wouldn't see the other fellas coming. <laughs> um, now, what would be your advice um, to any swimmer who wants to make it um, to the Olympics or Paralympics and um, be a successful swimmer and make the finals like yourself? Sure. I think one thing with swimming is there are probably at times more lows than highs because mm -hmm. you're training so much. You're probably not going to feel as great in the water most days than you are feeling great. So yep. I think it's all about working on the skills and, and working on the small things, which for me, yeah, I get in and grind it out and train hard all the time, and I've always done that. Mm -hmm. But I've only learned the last couple of years how important um, the recovery side of it is, the skills, the technique, and, and just mm -hmm. um, giving yourself a little bit of freedom to maybe have a session off every now and then if you really, really are uh, uh, buggered from training. Yeah. Maybe you actually do. Maybe I, I used to push a little bit too hard sometimes. So, you know, pushing hard is really important, but it's about um, getting that fine line between um, doing things extremely well and maybe even sometimes some people might go a bit easy or a bit too hard so yep. that's the thing also just just stick with it um, I suck with it for years of plateau um, mm. where I wasn't improving I could have quit uh, at the age of 13 or 14 and, and done some other sport but um, sticking with it was the best thing that I ever did uh, even though there's been so many uh, lows and, and not achieving the times that I wanted to I think sticking mm -hmm. with it and giving it uh, more time um, to learn and improve is something that I'm proud that I've, I've done. Uh, thanks, uh, Jacob, for coming on the podcast today and putting aside some of your time to come on and have a chat. It's been incredible to have you on and for you to share your story. Thanks, mate. Appreciate it. Go the Blues. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Jacob. Stay tuned, everyone, for some more Sporting Max.